But the same drive and the same passion was there, it was just turned in a different direction. So he was out there planting churches, preaching the gospel, he was mission-minded, you know, and it's sometimes, yeah, he was pretty driven. And he would say some hard things, and he would do some hard things, but that's who he was. But unfortunately, we all know what it's like to be judged. We all know what it's like when somebody sees some characteristics in us and then they make all these extrapolations, all these predictions, all these, well, he's like this or she's like this. Because sometimes if you just looked at Paul from the outside, you could think this dude is not caring. He's all about just getting it done. Well, we see a different side of Paul. When he starts writing 2 Corinthians, we start to see this guy who deeply cares. Of course, it was always there. But again, we have to ask ourselves, how often do we judge someone because of a personality, because of the way that they come across, because of our first few interactions that we've had with them, and we start to make all of these other assumptions. And Paul goes, look, I care. I may have said some hard things to you in my letter, but I did it because I love you. I did it because I care. And you know what? I am feeling very anguished about a lot of things. You see, Paul cared a lot. And because he cared a lot, he also hurt a lot. Isn't that the way it works? You know, have you ever been in a situation where you try to help someone? They know they need help. You know they need help. And you're trying to help. You're trying to help. You're trying to help. But they don't take any of your direction. Paul lived that life each and every day. Where he would constantly just be trying to help. And then he would just go, yeah, yeah, whatever. And so it hurt him. It did hurt him because he wanted the best for them. Not because he wanted them to follow him or do what he was he told them to do. And so Paul writes this letter and he's going on about that. And he's telling them, look, I care. I wrote those hard things because I care. I'm here for you. I care. Please listen to my letter. Listen to what I'm really trying to say to you. Because too often we get bogged down in the negative. Too often we see all the bad and we don't see the good. Right. It's the same with God. It's no different than what Paul was experiencing. We see it with God too because God may address our nature, which he does. He may challenge us and stretch us, which he does. We tend to forget that God thinks you're awesome. Mm. See, Paul and all of his letters, how they all start? You rock. Now, he didn't just say that in every letter because then we'd say, oh, yeah, it's just his stamp that he starts his letter with. One letter he said, you rock. The next letter he said, your faith inspires me. The next letter he says, you saints, you're an amazing group of loving, caring, powerful care. Like every letter, he addresses them personally. And he talks about how amazing, how awesome, how spectacular, how incredible they are. Yes, he eventually gets to some things that need to be addressed. Why does that get all the playtime? Why can we not focus on the fact? That God had worked greatly in their lives already and done great things. And that Paul thought that they were great. And in turn, God thinks that they are great. God thinks you're great. God loves you. God thinks you're spectacular. He looks at all your great strengths and great qualities and he is proud of himself. He is a proud Paul. I made that. Uh huh. Uh huh. And, and, oh, and even that. I made it all. It's wonderful. Thank you. See, he can actually do that. And he does. Because he's very, very proud of us. Why can't we focus on the fact that God thinks that we are great? I know it went through your mind. Because that's prideful. Yes, it is if you're thinking because you made yourself great. That is prideful. But if you think you're great because God made you great, because Jesus is making you great, that's different totally different mindset, and that's the way God looks at you. So some of us struggle, struggle with a negative, you know, personality where we can't see anything in the positive light. God just wants you to think you're great. Some of us think we're great already. God wants you to think you're great for the right reasons. Right. And because of the right source. Yep. And that's kind of what we pick up here as we start 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's pick it up. Verse 1. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, Letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not, in, not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. 
not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new, co of a new covenant. Not the letter, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter kills. Ever been killed by a letter? Oh, yes, you have. We don't call them letters anymore. We call it texting. We call it email. We call it Instagram, I guess. Tweeting. I've never done either of those. But we call it all sorts of things, but it's the letter. Have you ever read a text or an email and thought, what is wrong with this person? <laughs> what are they thinking? And just because they use caps, we automatically assume they're angry at us. <laughs> so all these assumptions, all these things, this is the problem with the letter. This is the problem with the words. This is the problem with writing. Writing is a wonderful tool. It's a great way to get our emotions out. It's a great way to think through things. But as communication goes, it's lacking. Because we don't see we don't always look at the context. We don't always look at the heart behind it. And that's what Paul is trying to say here. He's saying, look, you read my letter, but did you read my letter? You saw the words, but did you see the heart? Did you see the spirit? Did you see my attitude? Did you see that I care? Or did you just say, you're bad, you're rotten, you're no good, you're lousy? What did you see? What did you read? And that's where we have to be careful. That's why we need to study God's Word. That's why we need to dig in. Because if we don't, you're going to get a snapshot, you're going to get an opinion, you're going to hate something. Right. Think of even the law. It's the same principle. DUI, driving under the influence, is against the law. Now, you can follow the letter of the law, the words of the law, and go, okay, it's against the law. So what I'm going to do is avoid all major streets. I'm hammered out of my mind, but I'm just going to avoid the major streets. And anyway, I'm out in the country right now. What does it matter? See, that's following the letter of the law. You're missing the heart or the spirit of the law. What's the heart or the spirit of that law? You're going to hurt someone. In fact, you already have. But you're going to continue to hurt. See, and so easily we can get caught up in the letter instead of the heart, the spirit behind it. And see, that's what Paul's trying to defend. He goes, do I need a letter of recommendation? Do I need people to write you a letter? Because they couldn't call, right, or text. No, Paul's good. Go for it. Couldn't do that, so it would be another letter. You'd have to wait another long time. Like, do I need a letter of recommendation? Because if you read Paul's letters, if you read what he's trying to say here, at first glance, you may have some bad thoughts, especially if you read 1 Corinthians 7. And I have to make a confession. 20 years ago, I'd grown up with the Bible, all that kind of stuff, but then I started to study it, and I was reading 1 Corinthians, and I thought, I thought to myself, I thought, wow, that Paul, what an arrogant man. He's arrogant. He's prideful. He's demanding. He's not very compassionate. And I had all these thoughts go through my head. Why? Well, partly because that describes me. <laughs> But partly because that's the way it's written. That's the written word. And so unless you investigate, unless you dive deeper, unless you look at it in context, you will never see the heart. You will never see the spirit working behind it. Paul says our confidence comes from God, not from ourselves. And you will never see that unless you dig in. Who is this man? What's he trying to do? Otherwise, you're going to get caught up in the semantics, in the wording, in the figure out all these questions that are unrelated to anything. Because you're not digging. It's like any relationship, isn't it? Isn't it the same? You start a relationship, and we've got all sorts of forms of communication. We still blow it. And we make all these assumptions and all these things on people's you know, responses to us. Instead of digging, what do you really mean? What's really going on? Okay, I didn't appreciate the way you said that, but is that what it really means? So we get caught in this. And that's what Paul's, Paul's trying to defend himself. But more importantly, he's trying to defend Jesus. He's trying to defend God because he didn't want to be the one in the way. Just like when I preach every Sunday, I don't want to be in the way. I want to be out of the way. <laughs> 
So from now on, I'm going to preach behind here so that I'm not in the way. But so easily, you see, what can happen is we can fixate on the words or the person instead of the heart. And that's the message that Paul is trying to get across. Focus on the heart, the spirit. What is going on? What is he trying to achieve? Too many assumptions are made because we don't make the effort. Paul says in this portion again, like, what do I have to do? Have you ever felt that way in a relationship? What do I have to do to get you to really understand? What do I have to do? See, that's normal. Paul gets it, and he's trying to help us understand that. God says to us, how much more do I have to do? How much do I have to do? To get you to understand, I love you. I think you're great. I think you're awesome. I want you to do the best in your life. I've got your best interests. Right. What more do I have to do? I sent a letter, many letters of recommendation. I even sent my son in physical representation. What more do I have to do? And he pleads with us. Can you not see me? Can you not see what I want and what I want for you? that I want the best for you. Paul says, I bring you great news. I bring you great news. Not good news, but it's great news. Let's move on. And God just wants us to believe it. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses, because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? From what was glorious has no glory, now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of what... Uh, of which lasts, of that which lasts. What's the theme here? Glory. Yeah, it's not rocket science. <laughs> you know, whenever you read anything from anybody and they repeat a word like 17 times in a couple sentences, you got to go, oh, I think that's probably a pretty important concept here. Glory. It's glorious. And here Paul is comparing the old covenant to the new covenant and the differences between them. How the gospel of Jesus is glorious. More glorious. Because if the old, the law, the letter, the, the, the rules was glorious, how much more glorious is what Jesus brought? Because what did he bring? In comparison to what the Old Testament brought. You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about Exodus, right? He's talking about Exodus 34, when Moses had spent some personal time with God, which, by the way, would be super cool. And he comes down, and obviously, because he had spent time with God, he's glowing. I'm not really sure what that looks like, but this is what it says. In Exodus 34, verse 29, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. The Ten Commandments. Moses spent time with God and he was radiant. He glowed. God's direction. God's wisdom, spending time with God, was glorious. Glorious. Not a chore. Not something to jam into your schedule. Not a, oh, church this morning. I guess I should read my Bible. That's really glowing. Right? It was glowing. How much more than with Jesus? What did Moses bring? Laws. Rules. And at the end of the day, what happens with laws and rules? We break them. But Jesus brought a message of grace, forgiveness, mercy, the ultimate sacrifice. Freedom, not condemnation. Mercy, not judgment. Too many of us try to live in the old covenant. Right. Trying to earn our salvation. Trying to be enough. Trying to do enough. 
trying to work hard enough, trying to enough, enough, and you won't, you can't, you will fail. Too often, because of that, we look in the mirror and what do we see? Failure, right. not victory. Right. We see somebody who falls all the time instead of somebody who's a conqueror. We see all the mistakes and the weaknesses instead of seeing that I am a winner. I have won. Do you live in the old covenant? Or do you live in the new? Because Jesus says you are more than a conqueror. You have won through him. So it doesn't matter what we're facing or what we're going through. You already won. It's perspective. And so when you look in the mirror, what do you see? Do you see Moses? Do you see the old covenant, which fades quickly? Or do you see the new covenant? Do you see Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice that died, that killed, was killed and was raised from the dead? Do you live a resurrected life? Or do you spend most of your life living on the cross? Suffering. In pain. Denial, dripping of blood. Or do you spend most of your time in the grave? Sleeping. <laughs> I didn't know what else to go with that. What are they doing? Right? You just gotta lie there, right? So, sleeping. Or do you live a resurrected life? I'm new. I'm a new creation. I have overcome. I've got this. I've got this with Jesus on my side. I can do this with Jesus on my side. Which gospel are you fixated on? You know how one of the ways you can tell? If you tend to fixate on things like this, you say, well, we're all sinners. We all fall short. You know what? We're all, we all fall. We're all going to blow it. What are you focused on? You're focused on blowing it. You're focused on you're going to fall. You're focused on that. What if you took a different approach and go, yeah, I got this. With Jesus, I got this. We can do this. I'm going to overcome this. I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to do that. How do you think it's going to go for you? You know what's going to happen if your mindset is we all fall? What's going to happen to you? It's guaranteed. You're going to fall. But if you changed your mindset and had more of a gospel mindset, a Jesus mindset, and you said, I'm not going to fall. With Jesus at my back, Back of me up, I'm not going to fall. What are the chances? Don't you think they greatly increased? Psychology even backs that one up. A positive mindset as opposed to a negative mindset. Going to a test, thinking you're going to fail, pretty much guaranteed. Going in, thinking you're going to nail it, and you believe that, you're going to do a whole lot better. It's the same principle. Jesus invented it. God invented it. Not the psychologist. God said, no, with me at your back, you got it. Go and believe in that. But what's our problem? What do we focus on? What we see. Our experiences. What's around us. In next chapter, we'll look at this a little bit more next week, but it says in four, chapter 4, verse 18, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We panic because of what we see. We get anxious because of what we see. We get overwhelmed because of what we see. And God says, Jesus says, Paul says, quit it. Focus on what is unseen. Because all that stuff is temporary. And so that's it. But what does it take? What does it take to focus on the unseen? What you don't know. What you're not sure of, in a sense. Faith. Faith is the rock. Faith is the foundation. If you don't have faith, you're going to live in the moment, in the panic moment, in the anxious moment, in the overwhelmed moment, in the chasing your tail moment. You're not going to get it. You need faith. And what is faith? Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Certain of what we do not see. If you're relying on what you see, you're not faithful. Well, this is going to happen because of this. You see it. It's not faith. What about what you can see? Being certain of what you cannot see. So, in our lives, what do we need? Lots more 
faith. Yeah. Increasing in our faith. Because what happens to us? We get very faithful. Holly's really faithful. She's really fired up. She's going to be crazy. She'll be woo-hoo. And then a week from now or a day from now, she'll be going woo-hoo. And then she'll be going woo-hoo. And then it'll get quieter and quieter. Unless, of course, she increases her faith. How do you increase your faith? You get in the Word. Faith comes from hearing the Word. Not just hearing it, applying it to our lives. So if we slow down, what's going to happen? The seed is going to overtake us. What we see is going to overtake us. And you old people, that's what happens to you each and every day. You know too much. You're too smart. You live too long. You've got way too much wisdom. You're in trouble. you got to wipe it clean. The longer you live, the more you rely on what you know. And what you've experienced in your faith is not faith anymore. Join me in this troubled journey. <laughs> To discover and to deepen faith, being sure, certain of what we do not see. How hard is that? Is that hard? Because, you know, we'll go back to our story of Moses, right? <laughs> Charlie. <laughs> Charlie Neston. Some of you know him. <laughs> the Ten Commandments. So, you know, there's Moses, right? He goes up. And he gets time with God. Now, he didn't see God's face, but he was there with God. And so he's with God. And, you know, he's, can you imagine that? I can't. But it'd be pretty incredible. So he's coming down the mountain. He's like, boy, can't wait to get, can't wait to get back. Wait till I tell all the Israelites I was with God. It was incredible. God's awesome. I'm on fire for the Lord. And what does he walk into? Yeah, you can't really see well, but they make a golden cap. They're parting their faces off. You know, it was a disaster. Ever had that happen? You know, you're on top of the things are you're, you're great. You just haven't even made a great time with God. You know, something connected, you, whatever. And you're just feeling great, and all of a sudden your kids walk. Wow. <laughs> 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 oh, parents got that one. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, just something always happens. Yeah. See, this is real life. What happened to Moses is real. You experience all the time. You're on a mountaintop. You're with the Lord. And then you got to come down to earth. <laughs> and earth isn't that cool. Right. Right. So how do you maintain that? That's what Paul's talking about here. Is it shouldn't be like that. Where we're up here and then it's crash. Up here and it's crash. You know, up here and it's... You get the point. But that we can maintain that mountaintop experience. That with Jesus, it's different. We're free. We don't have to get trapped by that because look at all the assumptions that Moses made. Now, we know the whole story, but he came down and he automatically assumed that they were just blowing it. Yeah, in the moment they were blowing it, but what if they were getting it? Because we focus on the scene, what we see. A parent really understands this. You discipline your children. Teach them to do something, they don't do it. Teach them again, they don't do it. Teach them again, they don't do it. Teach them again for years. And then all of a sudden the light switch comes on. You go, what just happened? <laughs> or even worse, this is more painful as a parent. You know, your children, you have nicknames for them. You don't tell them, like demons. Um, <laughs> and they're really difficult. And then you send them off to, to spend time with the Walches. You know, and they come home and the Walches go, your children are amazing. Uh, and you go, demon? <laughs> see, we focus on the scene. What we see instead of what we don't see. So we automatically extrapolate and make all these predictions and all these things instead of believing, instead of having faith that it is working. <laughs> different people have different journeys. Right? And so what we see may not be what's really going on. And that's where that faith comes from. And that's what Paul is trying to get them to focus on is look, careful what we do with it. Careful how we approach this. Paul wants the mountaintop experience to last, to go deeper. The gospel of Jesus is more than just surface. It's more than circumstances. It's more than situation. It's more than stages of life. It's about learning to be content in all situations. Faith. Being sure of what we don't see. Trusting in God's grace and mercy. Learning that because of Jesus we can be free. Even during the rough times. Even when it doesn't seem 
like others around us are getting it. Maybe they are, we don't see it. Now, just to make sure you understand, because there's always two sides to the coin, this grace, this mercy, isn't free. It isn't just, woohoo, then I'll just float through life. Okay, that's not the picture. The picture is it takes effort. Your part is effort. Your part is desire. Your part is a heart that can be cultivated, not a stubborn, hard, lazy heart. See, so we do have to provide fertile soil for the gospel to take, and that's our part. We can't make it grow. We can prepare the soil. We can prepare ourselves so that we can grow. Dig deep. See the real glow, the real light that you can have through Jesus. And Paul goes on, and he talks about this light in verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, we are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Let your light shine. Don't veil it. Don't cover it. It is real. It's not just words. Let it shine. God's grace, when understood, when applied into our lives, produces a light, a transformation, transforming into his likeness. In other words, makes a difference. Our world, our lives live in darkness. We're surrounded by it. Personally, we're surrounded by. It. Think of all the secrets we can't tell because they hurt too much or that we think no one will understand. Think of the things that you know you should do that you don't do. Things that we say that we, things that we don't want to say that we end up saying. Too often we live in a shell, afraid of being exposed. Afraid of people really finding out who we are. We live in darkness. Searching for something. Wanting more. Wishing for better times. Struggling through every day. Or oblivious to things around us. Living for oneself. Confused and empty. Or driven and prideful. Creating our own path. There's so much darkness and so little light. Are you letting your light shine? <laughs> Paul didn't make this up. Jesus talks about it in Matthew 5, verse 14. He says, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Are you? Are you really the light of the world? It's an important question to ask. Are you the light of the world? For many, we don't even know what it means to be a light. I did for years. For years and years, I thought I did. I, I, I believed in God. I went to church. But I wasn't the light of the world. I was more like a strobe light. <laughs> You know, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. Are you more of a strobe light? Or are you a light? Is your light veiled, covered? Or do you let it shine? See, we have too many people that speak about Jesus and not enough people that be like Jesus. There's enough speech about Jesus. There's not enough being. And that's the goal, is to be like him. 
more than words can say, more than the letter, but do people see it in our lives? Do I allow these words to change me, to bring it to life? It takes effort. It takes tapping into the main light source. Sometimes it takes rewiring. You gotta rewire because you're just wired wrong and you need to get rewired and get wired, wired into the right source. I need to continue to do that. Like Paul said, it's not that I've arrived. We don't arrive. It's the journey. And the journey's fun when we approach that. I haven't arrived. That's great. I can continue. Continue to learn how to make my light shine. But be ready. Ready to be challenged. Ready to learn how to light up this world. What would you see as light? Well, you know, you read those scriptures and you go, yeah, we can be the light of the world. What does that mean? Does it mean you go to church? Okay, sure. But does that really impress the world? No. This is, how about reading your Bible? Does that really impress the world? No, it should impress you. But it might not impress the world unless you act upon it. So what would you concretely look for? Marriage. Right? Most people, many people in this world get married. Many, most get divorced. Many, most live in pain. Many, most live in suffering. So, wouldn't that be awesome if we could live in the light? Wouldn't that be awesome if we actually could be an example of what it means to truly love each other and work through all of our differences and continue to grow in that? You think that's easy? Yeah. Not if you've been married any length of time. <laughs> it's difficult. But that's powerful light. That's a strong light. When you can shine it like that, because you put Jesus, you allow Jesus to change you, to transform you into his likeness. I think anybody could be married to Jesus and remain married to Jesus. So what's my problem? <laughs> you think of some of the scriptures in the Bible. Ephesians 5 talks about marriage, and it says to the husbands, it says, husband, wash your wife with water through the word. Make her radiant. Radiant. Who was radiant? Moses was radiant. When was he radiant? When he spent time with God. Why? Is spending time with your husband like spending time with God? Lord. <laughs> All right, you guys have a good day. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> but it's true. That's what we're called to. But husbands, if you're trying to make your wife radiant by yourself, <laughs> she's complex. <laughs> but with him, it works. He takes all the pressure off. He takes all the heat off and you have no clue what she's actually thinking. Because she said 15 different things in the last minute. Now, which one should I react to? <laughs> Only he can help that. <laughs> That's why it says washing with water through the word. Do you ever pull out the word? Not to correct her or put her in her place, but to wash her, to make her feel radiant. Do you care how she's doing spiritually? You see what God's concerned about? See when we're radiant? We make, can you imagine if all the wives were radiant? They were glowing? They were like fired up? Would that not be a light in your community? Yeah. People go, oh, I want to meet this dude. He's doing something right. And that's what we're called to. We're called that in relationships, period. To be pure and holy. Imagine that. What a foreign concept in society. You're pure what? Why on earth would you do that? What a light. Because that's impossible in this world by yourself. Right. It is not impossible. You want to turn heads? You want to be transformed? You want to send a message? The right message? The great message? The good news? Be the light. And go on and on. Make it practical. Make it real. Am I being the light? And you're going to realize that at times you're a stroke light. Well, get plugged in. Figure it out. Get back connected to God. If you're a disciple of Jesus today, is your bulb burned up? Maybe you're not just plugged into the right source. There's a big difference between the two. Plug in. And then over time, you'll have to change your bulb. And maybe you're going to have to get a more energy-efficient light bulb. Because if you're older, your energy level's lower, so you better get something more energy-efficient. So that it lasts longer. And learning to do that. The gospel, the message of Jesus brings hope. It brings victory. It brings peace. What more 
could any of us ask for? What more could we offer others? There's nothing more. How's your life? Are you in waiting mode? Ah. Yeah, yeah, that's going good. But uh, you know, when I get that girlfriend, then we'll go really good. Or when I graduate, you know, I just, I just gotta get through this stage of life. If I just get through this stage and graduate, then I'm gonna be doing awesome. It's gonna be wonderful. You know what, no, when I get married, oh, we're gonna soar like eagles. We're gonna show all those old married, lazy, you know, people how it's really done. You know, no, 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 when I get my career rocking and rolling, then I'll have expendable income, we'll be able to travel, life will be great. No, no, it's when we have kids. These kids are so adorable, right? They're so fun. Then it'll be fulfilled. Then we get kids and go, when they leave? <laughs> then we'll be free and we'll really... Are you one of those? Wow. wow. Wanting? And then maybe you're at the other end. Boy, if I was 20 again. Yeah. I was much smaller then. <laughs> much easier then. But see, the wanting. Instead of the gospel, which is, today is my best day. This year, 2014, is the best year of my life. It is going to be the best. I'm 48 this year. I'm going to be 49, 48 rocks. It's better than 47, better than your age. I don't care what you say. <laughs> 48 is amazing. 2014 is going to be phenomenal. Why? Not because I can make it phenomenal, but I got Who I got in my corner? I got Jesus in my corner. Who do you have in your corner? He doesn't just come in your corner when you graduate or you get married. No, no. He's there. Do you see him? Do you allow him to be in your quarter? What's your view of 2014? What's your view of your stage of life? Are you wanting or do you got it? Right. Be the light. The ministry you're in, is it the best ministry? Darn right it is. And then when you move on, that'll be the best, best ministry. That's the way it works. If you embrace where God has you, it's going to be good. If you're always wanting, you're always going to be wanting. Trust me in this. It'll be this, then this, then this, you will never arrive. It'll be painful the whole ride. Oh, I could just get through this time, I have no time. Embrace it. Multiple children under the age of 10. You guys rock. Best stage of your life. We don't believe it. And so we don't believe it, it sucks. Where's your faith? What are you embracing? You asked for it. You wanted those kids. You got him. Why can't we enjoy it? Why can't we embrace it with Jesus in our corner? Because you're relying on yourself. We do that all the time. It's time to let go and let God get in the word, connect with God, build your faith, and have that relationship so we can be true lights out there in the, in, in, in the world. Let's get rid of yo-yo Christianity. You know, yo-yo up, down, up, down. I hate that when I talk to people. And you ask them, well, you know, my Christian life has been like a yo-yo. Really? Well, is it a Christian life then? Because my regular life was like that before I was a Christian. So what's the difference? And you get that? But that's so sad to me. You know, I study the Bible with tons of people. And often I hear that, well, you know, it's, it, it, my Christian life has been pretty good, you know. Ups and downs like everybody. No, that's not like everybody. That's like the world. Yeah. Let's try consistent growth instead. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have down times, but you shouldn't be the same. There should be a growth to your life. What if we brought that to the world? What if we showed them something different? Let's strive to be who God intended us to be. Let's walk in faith, not in sight. Let's focus on the unseen, not the seen. Let's blind the world with the light of Christ by showing them the effects of our lives. Let's strive to eliminate this yo-yo Christianity up and down and up and down and demonstrate consistency in our growth, in our desire to be more like Jesus, to be transformed into his likeness. Let your light shine. And if you're discouraged, because you're thinking, oh, I've not been doing that, wrong. You didn't get it. You're focused on you. I know you're not doing that. Focus on him. And that's how you will let your light shine. Let your burdens go. Learn to pass it off to him so that we can make a difference in our own lives and in the world around us. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your word. That is more than just words, God. That when we really dig in and we apply it to our lives, it's like. <coughs> Father, we thank you that through it, if we really adhere to your way, that it really can transform us to become more like you. Give us strength, give us courage. Father, I pray that each and every one of us will grow in our faith to focus more on the unseen and not the seen. Father, help us to trust in you and to know that your message, your gospel, is one of mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Father, that as we approach all of our relationships and as we approach our everyday life, that we will have that mindset that we are already a victor. The greatest battle has been won, that you conquered death, and therefore we too can conquer death. We don't need to live in guilt. We don't need to live ashamed. But we can live in faith. We can live transformed. We can live proud. We can believe and live like 2014 is the best year that we have ever, ever had. Father, thank you for that. Thank you that, that you want us to see things differently. I pray that we will emulate that, that we will do that. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.